Now let's talk about the chest. Uh, this part of our body, the upper thorax, the chest, front and back chest, uh, has most of our major organs. It's got the heart, it's got the lungs, it's got the liver, it's got our pancreas, it's got, the, it's, it's, got it's filled with stuff. And it's filled with very, very important stuff, which is why we have a rib cage protecting it. Um, but it's very important for us to be able to describe, again, especially in trauma, where things have penetrated into the chest. So we've got uh, some specific terms for describing where in the chest things are. If we're talking about going up and down in the chest, we can talk about, you know, at the level of the third rib, fourth rib, fifth rib, that type of thing. And as well, because the ribs go around the back, we can describe up and down using rib spaces, which we've already done. But now if we want to talk about how far left, how far right, how far around to the back do we want to go, so our X and Y axes, uh, to go along sort of how far we go, we draw lines. Imaginary lines, don't actually draw lines, imaginary lines. <laughs> so the first line we draw, imaginary, is down the middle of our sternum, which we call the mid-sternal line. And then as we go out to the side of the manubrium, there's, uh, it ends, actually I wanted to mention something else, and I should mention that now too. If you feel down along, sorry for the diversion, if you feel down along to the second intercostal space, and then you come across to where your chest is, you'll actually be able to feel a bit of a line between the gladiolus and the manubrium. And that line is called the angle of Louis, And it's uh, an important landmark for determining how far up and down you are. So just be aware that's there. And on thin people, you can feel those. Or not terribly muscular people, you can actually feel the going through. So getting back to mid-sternal line, if you go out laterally, uh, an imaginal line on either side, the right parasternal line or the left parasternal line, that's a little bit further out. If we talk about the clavicles, the clavicles are out here at the tip of the shoulder to here in the midclavicular line, or the, here in the side of the suprasternal notch. So in the middle of those, if you draw a line around there, that would be the midclavicle, and if you drop a line straight down, that's the midclavicular line. It's roughly just on the inside of the nipples, usually, and people who obviously don't have a large pendulous breast, if you're lying down, your breast can be in your armpit. Um, but if you're standing up in normal upright position, let's say on a reasonably fit male, the mid-sternal line usually comes in just on the inside of the nipple line. Uh, and then, uh, if you imagine your armpit here, the axilla, uh, there's a fold at the front of your armpit, and there's a little fold at the back of your armpit, kind of where the U of the armpit stops. So if you draw a line straight down from that front fold, that's the anterior axillary line. Let's switch over to the axillary line. So that's your anterior axillary line. Right down the middle of the armpit is the mid-axillary line. So when you're doing chest tubes and a lateral entrance to the chest, we'll often enter into the mid-axillary line in the fourth intercostal space, which gives you a a definite idea of where you are on your x and y axes <clears throat> and then the posterior axillary line is drawing from the back fold of the armpit and down and if we go around to the back um, we've got the scapula and the blade of the scapula here um, is the we call that the scapular line or the scapulary line and then right down the middle over the, the vertebra the spine of our back that's the vertebral line so that's how we define the axes around to the side, which I guess would be the x-axis, and the y-axis we define <coughs> using the ribs. So that's how we can basically coordinate the landmarks on our chest to find out where we are. Now let's talk about the positions of the body, the different positions that you can find people in, whether they're lying on their face, lying on their back, or the side, or sitting up. We've got medical terms for those as well. And though, again, those medical terms, you know, really, we tend to like using fancy terms in medicine. We don't necessarily have to, but it has definitely, uh, there's a whole culture of it, and you're not going to change it. So if you want to get in the club, you've got to learn the secret handshakes. And the secret handshakes to medicine is the language. Uh, I once read a, not sure if I have the number exactly right, but somebody said that if you're going to go through medicine, you're learning somewhere from ten to 20,000 new English words, words that the average English speaker doesn't use, like axilla for armpit or epistaxis for nosebleed. You have to learn all these words. And there's a ton of them. So this is your introduction to some of that nomenclature for the body. 
when we're talking about the position of the body, if somebody doesn't tell you what the position of the body is, so if they just say, you know, distal in the arm or whatever, something like that, we always assume that a body, when it's being described, is in what we call anatomical position. An anatomical position is considered to be standing upright, arms down at your sides, straight, the feet are pointing straight ahead, the head is looking straight ahead, and the, the hands are turned so that the thumbs are pointing away from the body and the palms are projecting forward. So that's considered the anatomical position. If, if the author or lecturer or clinician who's talking to you doesn't specify a different position, then that's what you assume that the, pos the position of the patient is. Uh, and of course, there are other ones. So there's supine and there's prone. Supine is lying on your back. Prone is lying down, um, sort of face forwards. Obviously, people find the prone position very uncomfortable. Uh, if you are approaching a patient and you see that they're lying prone, that usually makes you go, ooh, that's a little weird. Something's wrong with them. Maybe they're not responsive. Maybe they can't position their body by themselves. Sometimes people have difficulty uh, remembering the difference between supine and prone. Um, supine and prone apply not only to our bodies, but they apply to parts of our bodies as well. So, for example, if I was to grab onto something like this, I'm grabbing in a prone uh, grasp. If I grab onto it like this, I'm grabbing with a supine grasp. If you imagine grabbing a barbell, for example, that's a supine grasp of the barbell. The way I remember that is that if you're holding something, holding a bowl of soup up like this, then that would work. If you're trying to hold a bowl of soup like that, it's just going to fall down. So this is supine. This is prone. Same thing with your face. If your face is up, that's supine. You can pour soup in your face. But if you're lying down, you can't on, on your face, then you can't pour soup in your mouth. Uh, so that's prone. That, I, I think weird, but that's how I remember it. Fowler's position refers to whether somebody is sitting up or not. They can have their legs bent or they can have their legs straight. So the picture here, you've got somebody who is uh, in a Fowler's position and what we'd call a high Fowler's position. So if this is the hips of your body in here, this is your upper body, these are your legs. This is a high Fowler's position. This is a low Fowler's position. And when you lie flat, then you're in supine. So supine is basically the lowest Fowler's position you can get. When we're talking about Fowler's position, uh, their legs may be straight or their legs may be bent. It doesn't really matter. It's referring to the angle of the, of the torso to the angle of the thighs. Trendelenburg position is something that we don't use so much anymore, but you might see it work. Uh, some of the paramedic stretchers will allow a patient to go into Trendelenburg position. Hospital beds will go into Trendel Trendelenburg position where feet are up or head are down. Uh, there are still some uses for this. So, for example, if somebody... <laughs> has a cut throat or we're worried that they have emboli in their blood, we'll put them into Trendelenburg so that the emboli don't go up into their brain. We don't get air bubbles going into the brain. It goes into the lower part of the body, which now technically is the higher part of the body because we're in Trendelenburg because bubbles rise. So that's one way to try to keep bubbles out of the body. We also used to put, used to put people into the Trendelenburg position because we thought that it would uh, bring more blood to the head. So if people are feeling lightheaded, you put their head down. Um, we don't do that anymore. There's actually a really good paper about that. It's a comprehensive review by Gertz et al. It's 2012, I think it was. Yeah, Journal of Clinical Anesthesia. Read this article. It's really good. I've got the PubMed number there and the DOI number as well. Uh, it's very easy to understand. It's very easy to uh, read. It's not really complicated, but it's a good review. And it talks about the fact that in Trendelenburg, there's actually compensatory mechanisms in the body that go, oh, we're upside down and all the blood's going to our head. So the body kind of closes off. And it doesn't actually perfuse the head as well as we had hoped or expected that it, that it would. But what does work quite well is if you have somebody supine and you lift up their legs so that the blood auto-transfuses from the legs down into the body. And what they calculate is it's roughly equivalent to about a 250 mil, milliliter IV bolus going in. So lifting somebody's legs up is roughly about the same as giving them 200 to 250 mils of fluid through an IV line to increase their blood volume, the vascular volume. <coughs> and it doesn't have, it doesn't cause the rebound protective mechanisms that going into Trendelenburg does. So it's a good paper for you to be aware of. Anybody who does patient positioning, nurses, paramedics in particular, 
should be really familiar with this. Paramedics a lot because we move people around. Um, highly recommend it. Good article. It's one of your must reads. And then people can sleep on their sides or rest on their sides or collapse onto their sides, whatever, however they are. Uh, and we'll talk about right lateral recumbent and left lateral recumbent. Sometimes this is called the recovery position as well. So right recovery, left recovery. Um, but lateral recumbent is better. This person has their lower hand sort of tilted up in a weird way over their head. That's not necessarily a part of it. It's just that if you're lying on your side, you're lying right lateral. And if you're lying on your left, it's left lateral. That's how we describe those positions. Okay, hopefully your head's not too full yet. Take a pause if you need to, go to the bathroom, drink some coffee, or come back to this later. <clears throat> now we're going to go into anatomical planes and sections. We divide the body up as we look at the, or consider looking at the inside of it, uh, and we need to describe how that works. So we divide it up basically into three cuts, X, Y, and Z axes. So we can cut it here, or we can cut it this way, or, or we can cut it this way, I think is the other one. It's called the frontal or coronal, the sagittal, or the axial transverse cross or horizontal plane. And I'll describe what those mean. So this is essentially how we can cut the body up. Frontal plane, there on the left, the sagittal plane, and the transverse or the horizontal plane. I have found over time that students have a lot of trouble remembering what these planes are because it kind of seems arbitrary. Sagittal or transverse, we don't really use a coronal. You know, sagittal or coronal, those aren't words that we actually use in English a whole lot. But they are roots that we use in English. So I'm going to explain where the roots come from, and hopefully that will remember, help you remember the strange terms of, that we use for this, the planes of the body. Those planes, uh, before I go into the sort of the entomological roots of it, can also be used on different parts of the body. So we can divide the foot or the hand up. And remember, when we divide these things up, if we say this is a sagittal section uh, of the hand, for example, we're talking about the hand as it is in normal anatomical position. So when we're talking about planes, we're talking about cutting up a body that is in normal anatomical position. Right? Keep that in mind. So the lines that cut through the body are called planes, and the parts of the body that result, so if we cut the line, uh, the body right through as a, in a sagittal plane, uh, then we're dividing the body into the left and right sections. So planes divide bodies into sections. Let's talk about the first one. The corona is the outer portion of the sun. And when there was an eclipse, as you see in the picture here, then we can see the corona shining out. So you know, when kids draw a circle, they draw a picture of their house, and in the corner they draw the sun, they draw a circle, and then they draw the little flames around the outside. Everybody does that for some reason. That The flames that they're drawing are the corona. And in uh, the Middle Ages, when uh, Christianity was growing, and they wanted to convince pagans that Christianity was really cool, what they did is they would draw pictures of the saints, but behind the saints, they would draw the sun, because the sun is an important imagery in paganism. So they were basically saying, hey, look how cool the saints are. Even the sons are following them. The sons are blessing them. That eventually became more and more stylized until it was a little line that sort of went around their head. And you can see the line there. And those were referred to as coronas. So if you imagine that line that's going around the person turning into like a metal knife and <laughs> cleaving them down through the middle, that is what we call a coronal section of the body. We also sometimes call it the frontal section, because the coronal or frontal divides the body into the front and the back, the anterior and the posterior portions of the body. So that's the coronal plane or the frontal plane cutting through the body. Next one is the horizontal plane. Uh, horizontal obviously means side to side, the horizon, that's where we get the term horizon from, it's from the same root. So have you ever thought of that? Usually when I say this in class, students go, Oh, yeah, the horizon is horizontal. That makes sense. So that line that goes from side to side, the x-axis, is the horizon. And when we cut someone with that direction, we call it the horizontal plane. This is a very common way to divide the body up. The CT scans, as we go through, they'll look at it in horizontal planes. So sometimes it's also called the axial or the transverse or the cross plane. So there's four different terms that we use for this particular plane because we use it a lot. But horizontal plane is the one that I hear most commonly. Um, you'll also hear this is an axial section of the body. It just means that we've cut it through the horizontal plane. Last one. Uh, 
Sagitta in Latin means arrow, Sagittarius, I'm a Sagittarius, that's the sign of the archer. Um, so if you imagine that you took your bow and arrow and you shot somebody with it, it would go right through their body <coughs> and create a sagittal plane. And the sagittal plane divides us into the left and the right sections of the body. If we take that sagittal plane and put it right through your body uh, on either the mid-sternal line or the vertebral line, same line, then we'd be dividing through a mid-sagittal section. That's what we'd be, that's the mid-sagittal line. So if you want to cut your body in half this way, that's mid-sagittal. So hopefully that helps you understand a little bit where we got those weird terms like sagittal and coronal and stuff. Now let's talk about positioning and direction of, of the body itself. Here's our inexplicably nude people. You search for images for superior, inferior, anterior, lateral. Everybody's naked. I don't know why. It seems like you can't describe a body unless there's no clothes on it, but you can, but I've got these pictures. So if we want to talk about up and down, how do we say up and down in the body? Remember that up and down always refers to somebody standing in anatomical position. So we can say it's superior and inferior, which are fairly common words, or we can say um, cranial or caudal, uh, referring to up or down. So two different complementary terms for describing that. If we want to talk about front and back, we can talk about anterior and posterior. It's easy to remember those because everybody knows what posterior is. Uh, and the opposite of posterior is anterior. Ventral and dorsal are fairly easy to remember as well. Uh, if you just remember that sharks have a dorsal fin which swims through the water. It comes out of their back as they swim through the water, and that's the dorsal section of the body. So if we had a dorsal fin, it would be on our back. If I'm talking about the dorsal portion of your body, I'm talking about the back. So anterior, posterior, or ventral, or dorsal, take your pick, but they're terms that describe front and back. If you want to talk about the middle and the sides away from the middle, <coughs> uh, as you get closer to the inside, the midline of the body, we call that uh, the medial. If you're going in this direction, I'm going in the medial direction. And as I pass the middle line and start going out, now I'm starting to go into a more of a lateral section. The median is the middle of the road. It's the line in the middle of the road. So if you remember medial, median, it's the middle. And lateral, people think about sports and you toss a lateral throw, you're tossing it out to the side. So those are easy ways to remember what's the middle and what's the side. And then we use two other terms, proximal and distal. And proximal and distal aren't used for the head, the neck, or the thorax. They're only used for the limbs. And proximal means on a limb, either on your arm or your leg, it's up towards the body. So obviously this doesn't matter what sort of anatomical position you're in. Uh, proximal means closer to the body, distal means further away. So my elbow is uh, proximal to my wrist, and my fingers are distal to my wrist. So it describes where you are in terms of how close to the body, but only on the limbs. And then, if you're going in towards the body, the further you go into the body, the deeper you are going. So we say this is deep. So for example, uh, my bones are deep to my skin, and my skin is superficial to my organs. So superficial, when we describe people as superficial, they're very shallow, they don't go very deep. Uh, so same thing with the body. Something that's on the outside, more towards the outside of the body is more superficial. Things that are deeper into the body are more deep. And then ipsilateral and contralateral are terms that you'll hear uh, as well. Sometimes when we're talking about strokes, we talk about the ipsilateral versus contralateral side. <coughs> ipsilateral means on the same side of the body. Whatever side you pick, uh, it's the same side. So for example, uh, my left hand is on the ipsilateral side of my body as my left foot. But my left hand is on the contralateral side to my body as my right foot. They're on the opposites. So if you have to cross the midline, then that's contralateral. If you don't cross the midline to get from one to the other, that's ipsilateral. Good. Almost there. Let's talk about the terms of movement now, because we can move our body in different directions. If I wanted to describe to you that I'm moving in this way, what's the term for that? What's the term for moving in this way or, you know, up or down, whatever. So we have specific terms that describe how our bodies move. And usually it's in relation towards this core or central of our body. So 
abduction is a movement away from the midline. So if I have my hands like this and I start to move like that, I am abducting my right hand. If I have my hands here and I start to move them in towards the midline, then this movement like this is called adduction. And the way I remember that is that uh, this way I'm catching a duck. Works for me. So adduction is catching the duck and abduction is moving away from the midline. And that movement can be horizontal like this or it can be vertical. So if I'm moving towards my body, that's adduction. So this is horizontal adduction and this is, sorry, vertical abduction. Vertical abduction, vertical adduction, moving towards my center because I'm getting the duck. And this is vertical uh, abduction, moving away from the center of my body. Then we have flexion and extension. For our limbs, this is fairly easy. Um, this is flexion. When people say flex a bicep, or there's your big bicep, you're flexing it. If you're extending it out, we're looking at the angle here. So flexing is closing this angle, it's making it smaller. Extension is extending the angle, making it further across. Where people can get a bit confused with that is when it comes to our head or our body. If we're going like this, well, this angle is closing, but this angle is extending. And if you go like this, this angle is closing and that one's extending. So which angle do we care about more? When we're talking about the head and the neck, we actually care about the front more. So this is considered flexion because this angle is closing more. And this is considered extension. And sometimes you'll hear people talk about with spinal injuries, they'll have a flex X injury, which means flexion extension. So if you're in a car and you go whack, whack, like that, first you have hyperflexion of the cervical spine, and then you have hyperextension of the cervical spine, and you get flex X injuries. And of course, that can cause injuries in the brain as well, as the brain goes slam into the front of your head on the inside, and then slam on the back. And we call that, it comes from the French coup, and this is a coup contre coup injury, or coup contre coup, and like a North American accent. Um, and coup just means a blow, a strike in French. <laughs> so this is the strike, and then the counter strike as it goes back. So in your brain, you get a coup contre coup injury, and in the, the um, skeleton, the cervical spine, you get a flex X, flexion extension injury. Okay. Uh, we talk about medial rotation, moving inwards, and lateral rotation, moving outwards from the midline. Remember that when we're talking about anatomical position, the thumbs are pointing away from the body. So this is to rotate medially, this is to rotate laterally. Supination means to turn it so that something is facing uh, up or forward. So you can supinate with your hands in this position, or you can supinate with your hands down. If you think about the anatomical position, uh, I didn't use this term at the beginning because we didn't know it, but when we're in anatomical position, our, our uh, palms are supinated. They're turned towards the front. And again, just remember, this is a good way to hold a bowl of soup. This is a bad way <laughs> to hold a bowl of soup. And that, that's how we use the term supination. So there you go. A lot of terminology. And I, I know, because I've been teaching for a long time, that one of the questions invariably is, why do you have to memorize all of these terms? Like, why don't people just say the top of your hand, the bottom of your hand? Uh, we just don't. And you can't change the world. So it's a useful thing to remember. And remember, it's there to help your patients. Okay, hopefully that all worked out. Leave a comment in the comment section if you have any questions for me. Thanks.